Good morning, everybody. I'm Eureka John, and you're at Eureka Street Crypto, broadcasting from Leander, Texas. It is 6.59 in the morning on August 21st, 2022, on a Sunday. This is episode number 486. Um, on, on Let's see, on the audio podcast, it should be like 158. Eight maybe I don't know. I started um, doing the audio podcast well after I was doing the video way back in the day, um, but now I'm doing both. And I don't know why I just didn't just sync them up number wise. Just yeah, yeah whatever. Um, but this is my morning video blog and my brain dump, my sandbox for audio visual type of stuff, and my message in a bottle to reach out to others in Web3 and in this space and anybody else um, just checking up and seeing what I'm doing. Um, but um, yeah, <clears throat> uh, I talk about lots of different topics. Uh, I don't really stay on focus on any one narrow type of topic. Uh, I mean, I'll talk about everything from the original founders of Bitcoin and all the, the crypto punks, cypher punks that um, led up to Bitcoin all the way to what I'm going to talk about today, which is like DAO tooling, you know, so I mean, it all. Yeah, but I don't talk really about price. It's not really something that I like to focus on. Um, it's called the Eureka Street Crypto Podcast. Started off a long time ago, and I called it Eureka Street Crypto Hub when I first started. I was just searching for a name, and there's no hub about it. This is really just like my personal blog. Um, but uh, so I dropped the hub, and I just said Eureka Street Crypto Podcast, and then nowadays I don't even really like to use the word crypto that much. I mean. I, I, I use the word more of Web3 because I see this as different phases of the internet and I feel like we're going through a rebirth of the of the decentralization of the internet, kind of how the internet started way back in the day in Web 1.0. Um, the internet was decentralized. I mean, anybody who, who had the technical ability to spin up a web server could do it. You know, you could you could get your server, you could create a web server, you could create a website, you had to know HTML, you had to know how to, you know, either spin up your own web server or to to um, use somebody else's web server, um, how to do FTP clients, file transfer protocol. You know, is, you had to have is pretty high, um, uh, high on the spectrum of technical ability back in the day. And uh, <clears throat> so it was decentralized, but, you know, only a niche group of people could really understand how to how to publish on that. Um, and then came in Web 2.0. And you had the Facebooks and you had the MySpace, you know, you had, you know, all these social media, um, social media engines popping up. Um, you had things like Amazon and Shopify where people could easily put their stuff up for sale. Nobody really had to have any coding skills. Nobody had to know all the technical stuff about it. So it brought in a lower common denominator of people. And uh, it, with less technical ability, so in a way, it did kind of democratize it a little bit, but at the at the sacrifice of top down centralized control of all of your data and everything that you do, and putting guidelines and constraints, and then owning all the information that you put up there. And those companies have made a killing from that. You know, the Facebooks, the Googles, the you know, <laughs> the Twitters, you know, off of your data and selling your data. And uh, in order to be advertised to, and some people say, "Well, it's not such a bad thing." Whatever, it's, you know. But uh, <laughs> it becomes a bad thing whenever 
there, there starts to be to, to form the concepts of these C, CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies, social credit systems, being able to be persecuted based on things that that uh, and prosecuted based on things that you uh, have posted up on social media sites. Um, maybe you know what you've posted on social media could affect your employment, your your credit score. You know, once this type of stuff starts creeping in then it becomes really important as to who holds your data you know not just whether or not you care if you're being advertised to or not you know but even then you know that money that you could have gotten you know i used last episode the example of, of a washing machine repairman somebody comes in and uh, you, your washing machine is broken and they fix your washing machine and um, they say it's no charge and you say what no charge well i got I mapped out your house. I looked at all the books you read. I looked at the clothes you wear. You know, I, I, I learned a lot about you and I'm going to sell that information and I'll make well, uh, well more than enough money to compensate for the repair of the washing machine. You're like, ha, huh, uh, okay. Hey, wait a second. <laughs> I could have sold that data and I would have paid you to fix my washing machine. So yeah. And then there's that too. So in comes web three. And then, so we're now seeing a, a people taking back of their information, um, and automation of, of that type of thing. And, um, of, uh, not right now, you still need to have some kind of higher technical ability, kind of like when web three when web 1.0 came in you had to have you know knowledge of html a lot of times a web server and stuff like that and nowadays we're right back at the point where we're taking back our data um but the technical knowledge barrier is not as high and and we're trying to work at lowering that technical knowledge barrier for people to be able to own their data without having some centralized entity like web 2.0 involved and so that's basically what web 3 is all about um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, I kind of went on a, a little bit of a rant about that. Um, so I, I think the whole point that, that really started that was Eureka street crypto. And I'm kind of you know, taking crypto out of the name and putting web three, you know, so maybe it's just the Eureka street podcast. I don't know. Anyway, so let's go over here to the screen and go to the coin gecko, you know? Yeah, 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 sure. You know, all right. You know, Ethereum is down to 1600 Bitcoin, Bitcoin's at 21,490. Um, you know, you got a couple stable coins up there in the top. I don't know. And okay, sure. You know, the price of all this stuff, I don't even really look at price anymore, honestly. Um, so I won't look at price. What I do want to look at today is uh, some DAO protocols that I've been uh, reading about. And uh, one of them is the Orca protocol. And I'm, I'm looking a lot at DAO tooling. So, you know, what are DAOs, you know? Um, and in order to really understand DAOs, um, yeah, DAOs are, are, are an attempt to minimize trust in organizations, right? and to codify that trust and to have code be at the center and a lot of times organizations are traditional hierarchical organizations are top down you know and that's whatever the person at the top says that's what goes and yeah that's it um, DAOs are an attempt called decentralized autonomous organizations to coordinate human organizations or companies or whatever around a set of code and you know we've kind of tried things like this throughout history you know like the constitution you know magna carta the bible you know you go through the book the first five books of the, the bible the pentateuch you know leviticus is nothing but just laws <laughs> so yeah 10 commandments but uh, anyway uh, now we have code and we have this technology source in which we can implement and automate certain functions that take the humans out of it you know and um so yeah i i I, I, I've joined several of these DAOs, and to me, these DAOs right now, there are tons and tons of DAOs out there. Um, they're kind of like experiments, you know. You, you can you can try out DAOs, and each each uh, group of people puts in different rules and laws in their DAOs, and it's kind of like a way of trying out socialism without like uh, destroying people's lives and businesses, just doing it in, in a technical way. Um, so yeah, there's, there's all types of different DAOs for whatever your interests are, whatever suits your fancy. And um, yeah, so anyways, there's an article, um, Orca Protocol is experimenting around with it. One of the main, um, uh, I guess, contributors at Orca Protocol is Frog Monkey, who used to be at uh, uh, Bankless DAO, one of the... He, he was um, a, yeah. You know, he he was definitely in in a leadership capacity at the at the Bankless DAO. 
even though there's not supposed to be a hierarchy, of course. <laughs> yeah. uh, but and then Chase Chapman, she has her own blog and uh, own podcast as well that does nothing but focuses on DAOs and it's laser focused on DAOs and DAO functions. It's a good podcast. Um, anyway, so uh, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, but um, if you just Google Chase Chapman, you'll you'll be able to find it. Anyway, so um, let's let's read this article, and I I didn't really think of this whole idea of trustware versus socialware of putting words to a couple of these concepts that I knew were there, but um, you know a lot of times you just don't put words to them, and it's really amazing whenever somebody can put some solid words to ideas that you know you you thought of and you've seen examples of, but you never really thought about. So yeah. And that's, that's kind of one of these Eureka moments that I have all the time. That's why I do this show to share these Eureka moments. All right. So anyway, scaling trust in DAOs, trustware versus socialware. And the author, um, I does not seem to have an author. Um, although, uh, it, it, it's, it, kind of um, reads a lot like uh, a frog monkey article. And I've read some of his articles on the Bankless Dow newsletter in the past. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> in the past few decades, our trust in institutions has begun to erode. When government officials lied about invading Iraq or Iraq, <laughs> we lost trust in our representatives. When banks lied about the creditworthiness of mortgage-backed securities, we lost trust in our financial institutions. When news outlets began to report false information, we lost our ability to trust credible news media. Trust is the cornerstone of any organized society, from student clubs to governments. If we cannot be assured that our peers will follow the same rules we operate from, we hamper our ability to coordinate with one another. And we so... And so we attempt to codify trust. We create characters, we create charters and constitutions to set fundamental rules for the game. Laws help further elucidate the nuances of these rules, and we employ physical and financial force to create a cost to not playing fair. In doing so, we create a strong system of assurances that you and I will respect the rules of the game through codification, cultural norms, and consequences. Yep, so trust is definitely the cornerstone of any society. And this is me talking now. And, and, and DAOs are kind of a way, you know, blockchain is a way to take trust out of the situation. Zero knowledge proofs are a way to take trust out of it. You know, a lot of times when you, you hear ZK proofs and zero knowledge proofs and, and, and you know, roll ups and all that stuff in the, in the, in la on layer twos in, in the crypto world. What does that mean? Well, it means that you don't have to trust the person to know what they're saying is correct. You know, um, say for is it like say say somebody you know has been kidnapped. You know, and there's that that classic scene of somebody sliding the suitcase over. You know, and yeah, how do I know it's all there? You know, and the, there's going to be the exchange. You know, the the person for the suitcase of money, and uh, <clears throat> you know, then it always. A lot of times it ends up in the movies, they open the suitcase and there's like one top layer of dollar bills and everything underneath of it is just like paper, you know, and, uh, like, ah! and then the machine guns fl fly and everything like that. You know, so th that's kind of a you don't trust that other person, but you, you want to know that they're uh, telling the truth, you know, and so we're trying to code rules to do that. And that's that's what zero knowledge proofs are doing. They're basically, you don't trust the other party, but you um, know that what they are supplying is accurate and true. Anyway, so to continue with the article, for most of human history, these structural guidelines existed at the social layer. They required humans to create, disseminate, and enact these rules, which ended up being fraught with operational error, human biases, or limitations on available resources. As, as an example... We say the law is blind and applies indiscriminately, but because we rely on humans to enact laws, we run into biases around race, gender, socioeconomic status, and other demographics. However, we live in the 21st century, surrounded by rapid innovations in technology with deep impl implications for how we organize and trust one another. We are able to encode rules into our technologies and minimize reliance on humans as intermediaries, even though encoded rules have biases. In doing so, we begin to shift organizations from purely socialware to those aided by trustware. So socialware is the whole idea of having to trust somebody and a humans to implement um, some laws that have been enforced. The, the, the human law enforcement is socialware. You know, trustware is technological um, uh, enforcement, I guess. Something that is encoded in order to keep something secure. So trustware versus socialware. 
So this is where it gets a little more clear, trust me. So contracts, laws, charters, constitutions, and other such agreements are mechanisms that organizations use to set rules between agents in a system in order to assure certain behaviors. This assurance can come from two places. One, so socialware and trustware. So socialware are mechanisms that create assurances through human relationships, including a high social coordination cost. Like, say, for instance, a police department. <laughs> that's a socialware, you know, and that's a high social coordination cost. Uh, trustware, mechanisms that create assurances through technology, incurring a low social coordination cost. And that's, you know, um, a lock and key, you know, an alarm system. So anyway, uh, so yeah, do you want police? Do, would you rather have police pe policemen, police people patrolling the neighborhood and, and you have no alarm system? Or would you rather have a highly secure alarm system and no police patrolling the neighborhood? Uh, yeah. So that's socialware versus trustware in, in my words. Anyway, so take, for example, a simple lemonade stand. Now, this is the article. You could set up your stand and sit there for a few hours waiting for people to come by and purchase your delicious drink. But the assurance that people will pay is enforced at the social layer. No one will steal or underpay for a drink if you're standing there monitoring each transaction. Though this method produces high assurance, it comes at the cost of your time. This is socialware. A form of trustware would be a vending machine. It serves the same purpose as a lemonade stand, but the machine itself produces the assurance through technology. It's much harder to steal or underpay when rules are codified into a physical machine that dispenses lemony goodness. Um, so, and it shows a little, you know, just a picture, a graphic. Socialware, you pay the human. Trustware, you pay the machine. Um, so, take another example. Protecting your valuables. You could lock your belongings away, trustware, or rely on the legal system to protect them. Socialware. You know, like I said, you know, the cop patrolling the neighborhood or the fancy alarm system with the, the lasers and, you know, the Mission Impossible type of scenario to get in there. Anyway, in theory, both assure that your property will be protected. The lock provides assurance through its physical presence, while the law provides assurance through consequences with decades of precedence. Off with his head! Uh, however, actually, in actuality, socialware is only respected when the outcome is enforced through coordination between lawyers, judges, and law enforcement, whereas the locks enforcement is embedded into its function. All right, cool. So, furthermore, the social cost of, of the law is high. Setting up contracts involves lawyers, money, time, knowledge of the legal system, and the social cost of a lock is low. You just go to Home Depot and you buy a lock. You know, you can even buy a lock at Dollar Tree or Dollar General. Um, it's easy to install a lock and distribute keys to trusted key holders, all of whom understand how keys and locks work. But, you know, somebody can come along with a sledgehammer, and if they know the cops aren't going to be around, there's no video cameras or anything, all they got to do is just sit there and uh, take a sledgehammer to that padlock, right? Now, so <laughs> there, there's pros and cons of both, right? You know, it costs a whole lot to hire somebody to sit there and monitor your your property, all your crap, you know, 24 seven. But at the same time, you know, so you could put a lock on there. But if that lock's not good enough and a super high, expensive, amazing lock and alarm system, then, um, yeah, yeah. All they got to do is come by with some, you know, lock pliers, you know, or whatever they call them. And then just, uh, yeah, <laughs> take your crap. So anyway, social and trustware and DAOs. Socialware and trustware and DAOs. So this is how it's all applying back to DAOs and what I was talking about. Blockchain and smart contracts are a massive technological level up for trustware. Through code, we're able to create strong assurances that members of a given system will behave as the system permits them. Permits them. They cannot lie, cheat, steal, or manipulate by bending or breaking the rules. Um, by using blockchains as our underlying assurance mechanism, we can codify organizational governance through code and not purely documented principles that rely on humans to coordinate around. So yeah, you know, you don't have to have just the constitution. You can have the constitution in code and if it's violated, it automatically gives whoever violated it a slap on the wrist, you know, or whatever, you know. So in doing so, and it does, doesn't have any people to say, hey, wait a second, they violated, you know, the second amendment. Uh, did they violate it? And then there's like 10 years worth of debate before they actually punish somebody, you know, so I don't know. And so. <laughs> So no, no, if the law's broken, it automatically just, you know, just yeah, it swats that fly. So in doing so, so, so let me go back and read this again. So by using blockchains as our underlying assurance mechanism, we can codify organizational governance through code and not purely documented principles that rely on humans to coordinate around. In doing so, we foster great trust between parties by minimizing trust in people and maximizing trust in technology. 
So yeah, now we have the technology to kind of make it in a world to where we don't have to trust anybody. Is this good? Is this spiritual? Honestly, I'm I'm I'm, ser- I'm asking this as a serious question. I'm not trying to be funny. When you take trust out of the world and technology takes over trust, are you in a sense taking God and faith out of out of the world? You know, what does this do to humans in their psyches? If you take the whole idea of having to trust somebody else, you know, isn't trust like a leap of faith? And if you take faith out of our basic everyday human interactions, what does that do for the human psyche? This is, this is a question. I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, it, it just makes me think. So anyway, this whole idea of, of trusting in technology, this is the great promise, in quotes, of DAOs. Code at the center, humans at the periphery. Huh. Okay. And yeah, this is, this is, it's interesting, you know, with the whole idea of like AI taking over and, you know, the matrix and yeah. yeah. And, and there's this article here. Uh, what do we do about the, about the biases in AI written by the Harvard Business Review? I'll link this one in the description, but it is, it, it's a, it's a really good question. You know, the people bring their biases whenever they start programming into AI, then AI works off those biases. Um, but, you know, just the whole idea of we're taking our trust and our faith out of uh, human interactions and organizations and we're putting in code. Well, that code is also written by somebody as well, you know? So, and then, and then AI would create its own biases. I don't know. So I'm just trying to piece all this together. So anyway, this is the great promise of DAOs. Code at the center, humans at the periphery. This is the idealistic model that allows us to maintain flat organizations that rely on consensus because we can outsource the execution of decisions to code. DAOs were envisioned as mostly trustware. So yeah, it kind of brings back to this question, you know, of of trust and faith and stuff like that. And if we, we put that all in code and eliminate the whole need for trust and faith, I mean... A lot of trust takes time, you know, and to cook a pizza faster, if, if a pizza needs to cook at 400 degrees, you don't cook that pizza any faster if you if you ramp up the temperature to 500 degrees, it just burns it. So can you do that with trust? Can you codify trust and in a social organization to make decisions go faster or does it need that time like cooking a pizza you know i don't know this is this is questions that are coming into my head you know so is it really possible to completely codify trust anyway so yeah this is the promise of DAOs: humans at the center you know, code at the center humans at the periphery it's the idealistic model that allows us to maintain flat organizations that rely on consensus because we can outsource the execution of decisions to code DAOs were envisioned mostly as trustware. So DAOs are are the idea of flattening these organizations is to create kind of like a technological padlock mechanism on human organizations that don't rely on all the constant surveillance and the trust and everything else and the relationships out there. So anyone, however, anyone that has worked within a DAO in the past year that knows this is rarely the case that DAO is trustware. In reality, many DAOs operate using socialware, relying on documented practices and hoping there is sufficient human attention and coordination to follow these written rules. So yeah, and it shows a little graphic, DAOs in theory and DAOs in practice. You know, everybody, you know, constantly pre about the, and how amazing DAOs are, you know, with code at the center, flat organizations. But if you've ever been in a DAO and you've tried to vote on anything and all the politics and then like 10,000 meetings for this and that, oh my God, dude, it's like pulling teeth and then trying to wrangle multi-sig holders on, on top of that in order to, uh, to actually uh, get a vote through, you know, and to, to, to no, once a vote is ratified to actually enact what, what people voted on, you know, and to pay people out, oh man, trying to wrangle multi sig holders is a task all in itself. I haven't really had to do it because I'm not an op- in the ops side of things, but I see it. Um, so anyway, I get notifications on my phone whenever I need to to sign a multi sig thing. <laughs> yes, I do it quick. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, social wear and DAOs. All right, so here's the, to continue with the article. Much of the organizational structure and governance in most DAOs exists at the social layer through the codified documentation and processes that live on Notion and Discord. They said discourse, but it's Discord. We set rules about quorum, term limits, voting thresholds, etc., and then proceed to vote on snapshot and rely on a multi-sig to execute the terms of the snapshot vote as per the rules we set. 
Uh, and Snapshot is is a tooling. It's a voting tooling on in DAOs and allows people to connect their wallets and to cast their vote. You know, a lot of times via how many tokens they have, and it collects all the votes. And then, yeah. So and then it connects to a multi sig wallet, I guess. A lot of times, anyway. So I've uh, to continue with the article. I've had a lot of these experiences as bank as, at Bankless DAO, which you know makes me think this is Frog Monkey writing this because he used to be in Bankless DAO. So we spent dozens of hours working to set proper rules, such as project proposal framework, governance rules, seasonal specification, and Writers Guild document, Writers Guild governance document. Although we had systematized our rules, we still relied heavily on human coordination. These rules only mattered if we had awareness to follow them. And because humans are prone to error and forgetfulness, there were many times we did not abide by our own standards. <laughs> I see this happen all the time in DAOs. The highest social coordination cost of social wear often results in a gap between how a system is supposed to operate versus how it actually operates. All right, theory and practice. You know, you can't read a book about how to play baseball and then suddenly go out there and hit grand slams. That's for sure. Um, you know, you can't you know read a book about how to do an, an Ollie 360 kickflip, you know, and then go out there and do it. You got to practice and practice. So anyway, trustware and DAOs. Trustware and DAOs means bringing in rules on chain and uh, bringing using blockchain and smart contracts rules. Rules defined at the social layer can be brought on chain and enforced without reliance on human coordination. There are a number of examples of trustware and DAOs. There's a lot of DAO tools like Juicebox, Moloch, Governor, and Pods, to name a few. And I can name some. Snapshot, you know, we have uh, Coordinate. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of them. There's a bunch of tap tools that help DAOs function. Um, as trustware to eliminate the people out of it, right? Um, so anyway, these tools allow humans to make decisions at the periphery and rely on code to execute the consequences of their decisions as defined by the rules of governing smart contracts. This type of technology is different from simply digitization. Digitization takes something analog and makes it digital, including all sorts of redundant human tasks. Trustware is a subset of digitization that focuses specifically on trust agreements that incur a social cost through coordination. Uh, digitization often reduces social coordination costs, but it doesn't focus specifically on trust. So there's, there's a difference there between digitization and then actual trustware. So, yeah, um, we cannot digitize trust until we have Sybil and censorship resistance, both qualities of blockchain. And Sybil resistance is the whole idea that uh, Sybil are multiple people, you know, somebody creates multiple accounts to try to vote tons of times on something in order to bend the vote in their favor, right? That's what civil and and civil resistance is is the ability to be able to counteract and fight against people doing that using multiple accounts to try to uh, take over a network or a decision in order to vote, you know, tons of times on on the way they want it to go. So anyway, uh, take for example the governor pon contract. As mentioned above, many DAOs use a combination of snapshot and multi-sig, including Bankless DAO and Yearn DAO. In these cases, token holders vote on snapshot but rely on coordination between multi-sig signers to execute their decision. And that's a form of social wear, right? Wrangling the multi-sig people. Uh, the governor contract automates this step, automatic, automatically executing a transaction as soon as a vote reaches certain governance parameters like quorum or submission thresholds. The governor contract provides equal assurances as the snapshot plus multi-sig combination with less social coordination. Uh, in other words, trustware. So the second a vote goes through on snapshot, the the multi sig is triggered. It doesn't take trying to get people to you know to to find the multi sig holders and you know get them to 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 go home from Starbucks and get on their computer and to sign that multi sig contract. No, it automatically triggers the multi sig. So that 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 eliminates a step out of that, and that's trustware, right? Um, so the trust minimized environment that trustware creates is what allows strangers to raise $40 million to buy a copy of the Constitution. Such outcomes would likely not be feasible if relying on legal assurances and not smart contract assurances. So and then it goes into an, a, a section of the article here. Trustware is a spectrum. So there's not just one black or white Boolean trustware versus socialware. There's a spectrum of that right now. And DAOs are working in various sections of the spectrum. So one important caveat to note is that trustware and socialware exist on a spectrum. The definitions above are relative to one another. They are not absolute. 
And then here's, I highlighted this, multi-sigs are a great example. At Orca, we had a weeks-long debate on whether multi-sigs are trustware or socialware. After all, having a treasury managed by multiple signatories reduces the harm of any one bad actor relative to a single address controlling all funds. But at the same time, have you tried wrangling multi-sig hold signers? It requires a bit of social coordination. So multi-sig, is that, is, is that trustware or is that socialware? It's both. Why not both? Yeah. So we settled on the fact that multi-sig are closer to trustware than a single EOA account, but closer to socialware than something like the governor contract or even pods. So there's a balance, right? Balancing trustware and socialware. Trustware is not the end all be all for DAOs. DAOs are inherently human organizations that will require systems to adapt to how humans relate and behave, not robots. But successful DAOs will have a combination of socialware and trustware, each with its own healthy balance depending on the needs of the DAOs. As of now, most DAOs orient heavily towards socialware for apparent reasons. One, socialware is flexible and can adapt to changing circumstances much faster than trustware. Two, socialware is easier to implement, requiring less technical knowledge and execution. You don't have to configure socialware. It's like, it's basically a conversation and a handshake, right? So, and then three, trustware can leave a DAO susceptible to governance attack vectors. Um, yeah, just like uh, an alarm, somebody could decode the alarm, right? So, and then four, trustware is still underdeveloped and cannot adapt to the granular needs of human governance. And we are at the very precipice, the very beginning of uh, all this DAO stuff and DAO technology. So there's a lot of work to do. So anyway, at Orca Protocol, our view is that assurance is provided by the blockchain unlocks a new paradigm of trustware technology that is relatively underexplored, one that could potentially reduce the friction and operational overhead that slows down companies and creates unfavorable working environments. Traditional organizations over-index on socialware precisely because they have only a smattering of trustware at their disposal. Whereas in, web, in the Web3 world, we're still only scratching the surface of what organizations operating on trustware look like. And that's what I was talking about. It's about the very beginning. You know, we're coming back to this decentralization, this owning of our data and and the technology curve right now is a little high for Web3, you know, just as it was in Web1. But that technology curve is starting to decrease as we're creating these things, this trustware, you know, in order to implement. And uh, we're learning, right? So anyway, over time, we expect DAOs to transition elements of socialware into trustware and to expand the code at the center of the organization. But this will take time, technological advancements, trial and error, and continued mistakes and iterations. We're grateful to be a part of that process. Anyway, that was written by Orca Protocol. And there's another article here called The Bull Case for Pods. Um, and I didn't even go into pods, but pods are another example of of trustware going into DAOs to be able to create atomic units of working groups in DAOs in order to better map out and uh, how people are working in DAOs and to keep track of that and stuff like that. Um, it's, a, it's a really good article as well. I obviously don't have time to read it right now. Maybe I'll read it tomorrow. But, um, you know, the whole concepts of, of pods, so you have the DAO at the top. And then inside the DAO, you have all these working groups, right? you know, like marketing, you have uh, ops, you have, you know, AV guild, uh, guilds, you know, you have writers and writing, design, um, treasury, you know, translation, you have all these different groups working, but uh, they're all dependent on one single multi-sig treasury at the top. Well, what if each working group was like a pod and they had their own multi-sig and they had their own treasuries all that went underneath the treasury of the DAO. and they even on top of that what if each pod had its its own ens name and right here as you can see um there's an ens for um the orca core they created a core pod um and let me pull up this web page and it, it's it's orca dash core dot pod dot xyz and i um i went to the ens directory and i created a eureka dot pod dot xyz so if i had a eureka dow you know i could do a eureka marketing or a eureka operations or eureka av and then and if i had a bunch of people working for me i could separate them all out and into these different pods and create urls for them you know and each of them has their own little treasury so orca, orca core here as you can see has its own treasury and you can see who all the members are on there and the, you know so yeah and <laughs> It, it creates little mini DAOs within DAOs and it kind of it adds in a whole new level of trustware within the DAOs. So you have, yeah, so the, I think in order to understand pods, you have to first understand the difference between socialware and trustware. So 
Um, so read this article first, the one that I read to you, or just go by what I read you, and then go to Bullish Case for Pod's article on the on the orca.mirror.xyz site. There's a lot of really good articles on this Orca website, and then the documentation in here about what are pods as well as good in the Orca protocol documentation. So yeah, go to orcaprotocol.org, or, or uh, yeah, I think that's what, it, yeah, orcaprotocol.org and you'll learn all about this. I'll link all this stuff in the in the description, but it's fascinating work what they're doing. And uh, yeah, like I said, you have to really kind of read the the very highest level first about what trustware versus socialware is and these problems that they're trying to fix. And it kind of pinpoints stuff that you, you've thought about, but you didn't know you thought about. So <laughs> anyway, oh man. That being said, it's Sunday. Um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get on out and do stuff with my family and go skateboarding, go to the gym and all that crap. So um, I will talk to you all next time I talk to you. I've been kind of going out of cadence, I guess, now about once a week. So it might take me a while to get to episode 500. I don't know. But uh, I've been staying busy, man, with like all this DAO work and you know podcast stuff. And you know, I don't know if you heard the, uh, I, I did the voice of Paulina on the Bankless HQ podcast. And that was, that was pretty fun, man. It was a really new experience. Experience. I didn't know half of what was coming out of my mouth as I was saying it, but then I read back over it and I was just like, wow, okay. Um, anyway, all right, I'll talk to you all later. Dude. Oh, all right, here we go. There. Thank you for making it to the end of this program. If you actually like this content, give a thumbs up. And if you want to hear more, just hit the subscribe button. I'm available on YouTube, Odyssey, and BitChute, and on all the major podcasting platforms in audio version. Spotify specifically, if you would like to follow and leave a review, that would help a lot. I am also available on Twitter at EurekaJohn1. That's E-U-R-E-K-A John, J-O-H-N, and the number one. My DMs are always open. Feel free to shoot me a message. Thanks again.